So in this video, I'm going to talk about protections against cross-site request forgery vulnerabilities. So to start with, as, the, as a user of the internet, the things that you could do to protect yourself would be to just not click any links or visit any websites that you don't trust. Now, there's a whole bunch of ways that we've talked about in the previous video about um, ways that an attacker can get a um, victim user's web browser to initiate connections and requests. So, you know, I guess you could live in a bubble and just just not visit any websites or click any links. Um, but that's not really a very um, realistic defense for an organization to take. So it's quite common to, for security training that organizations provide to their employees to say, don't click any links that you don't trust. And there's a reason for that is because, you know, the, if you click on a link, it could result in all of these things going wrong. Uh, but really, the, in most cases, the onus rests on the server, uh, on the organization to make sure that their websites and web servers are not vulnerable to these attacks in the first place. Um, but if you were ca a cautious user, the sorts of things that you could, you know, there's various degrees that you could take to try and protect yourself against these things. So there are some simple actions that you can take, and then there's the more extreme things. So uh, simple actions would be to, um, if there are websites that you really didn't trust, just open an incognito, like a private browsing tab, and visit those websites from within that private tab, uh, because they won't send along your cookies to that you've got open in your main web browser that way. And so that will protect you against those websites that you visit in the private tab, um, causing cross-site request forgery attacks against the other windows that you've got open, other um, websites that you've got open. You could use different web browsers or even browsers in containers or virtual machines to kind of separate out the different sorts of things and websites that you're accessing to limit the, the damage that happens. And um, that's kind of on the more extreme, like um, most proactive that you could be um, you can also just log out of websites when you're not using them um, so and clear your cookies more often. So if you finish doing your um, internet banking, log out of it, which is why um, most internet banking websites will basically log you out very quickly when you're not actually actively using it, they will log you out um, and you know you don't have to be inactive for very long. But then there's a usability um, thing there. So for example, someone like Facebook won't want you to ever log out of Facebook. They always want you there. So they'll never just log you out because you've been inactive. Whereas a bank, is, they care about security more than that. So they'll, you know, like if you're not actively using your internet banking, they'll log you out of it. Um, so, but you know, you can, as a user, log out of Facebook when you're not using it. Um, Maybe in general, it's good advice um, for Facebook. But if you know, but generally speaking, if you log out of things and clear your cookies more often, that will provide some protection. Okay, so that's what you could do as a user. But what do the um, what can you do as like a website designer to protect yourself? So a server um, should check the headers, so they can check a combination of the origin and referrer, uh, and whether that matches the host header or URL. So the um, the origin is like the domain and um, domain name and the port number that the request is being sent from. The referrer is essentially the same thing, but it's like the URL to the web page that the link was clicked on, for example. Uh, and you can check whether that matches the server itself, and you know sort of check whether it's like all coming from the same um, domain. Um, sometimes some of this information can be spoofed. Um, so you can combine that with values that are sent along with the requests that are authorized. Um, so you have some values that get sent along that the attacker can't guess, and it gets... Um, so most of the defenses uh, embed some authentication token into the request itself. Um, and I think there's more information about that. So. Um, quite a lot of frameworks, if you're using a framework to build a website, um, they will include some cross-site request forgery defenses uh, in the framework itself. Sometimes they'll just like, just automatically be used as soon as you're using the framework or you have to like enable it, um, like change a setting to enable it. 
um, you should always use that. If there's a framework that, if the framework has defenses in, against cross-site request forgery, you should use it. Um, and thankfully, now that a lot of frameworks do that, the prevalence of these kinds of attacks are a bit less common, um, but they're still as critical, and it's still super easy that to design a website that doesn't that doesn't defend against these things correctly. So some of the most common ways that this works is to have a cross-site request forgery token that gets generated, um, and and that um, and and every time that you um, the user gets a form or some entry point, the server will send along the token so that when they then initiate that action, it gets the the token gets sent along as well, which proves that you were the one that like received that. Um, uh, like interface that gave you the option to do the thing and then you follow through with that action and send that token back through. So that can be known as a form key or a synchronizer token pattern. And so you have these random tokens, usually it's just like a long string of like randomness that the server generates and they get embedded in all of the HTML forms. Um, and then yeah, when it gets, when that form is submitted, it gets checked on the server side to check that those tokens are there also. And if the tokens aren't there, we usually just won't process the request. Uh, you can also embed tokens inside URLs, so like in a GET request, for example. Um, but it can be um, vulnerable because those can get exposed in various ways. So, for example, if you, um, it, it can be ref in a referrer. Um, so, if you were clicked through to another website. Um, you know, you can expose URLs in um, like history, like web browser hi history, it gets exposed in um, like referrer URLs and, and a bunch of other places. So, yeah, I mean, it's better than nothing. Uh, post requests are a bit better because that stuff doesn't typically get uh, exposed in so many ways. Um, but yeah, so form keys or synchronizer token patterns are used in lots of frameworks and so for example one example is Drupal uh, uses that approach uh, another approach is um, cookie to header <clears throat> as this um, uh, diagram quite accurately reflects a cookie to header situation um, so I tried to say that with a straight face um, so, and that relies on the fact that same origin protects um, uh, protect the token. So you can copy the cookie to a custom HTTP header. Uh, an attacker can't guess the token to also place it in the header. So that's used by various JavaScript frameworks like AngularJS. Um, and <clears throat> so, so that's where you're um, basically having some um, token that appears in multiple places, so it could be in a in a in a cookie matching uh, header, or um, and that way you don't need to like maintain um, the 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 um, state between the different um, server requests and things. <clears throat> so, if you've got um, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities on the same domain, it doesn't even have to be on the same subdomain, but anywhere on any of the subdomains on um, then that can circumvent all of these defenses because you know once you've got some JavaScript running um, within the context of the server domain um, on the victim's machine, then it can read the um, all the tokens and send them along with the requests. Um, so you know these defenses depend on the fact that the attacker is just generating, uh, they're, they're blind to what's happening within the browser and they're just generating these requests. Because um, yeah, JavaScript can read all the randomly generated tokens and craft an attack that circumvents them. <clears throat> so another um, um, way to prevent um, cross-site request forgery attacks is to require user interaction. So, uh, you know, often with security, we've got this trade-off of security and usability, and these s solutions we've talked about so far are basically invisible from the user. They don't even know that these things are there. They're all hidden form fields and cookies and headers and things. So it's all stuff that the user is not exposed to. 
But if you want to be extra careful, what you can do is actually require the user to actually confirm this is what they're intending to do. <clears throat> so this is the highest level of security that you can add. And it's why uh, you know in internet banking, they'll typically um, ask you to type something into a physical device like, do you, are you, is it really you there on the other end? You know, we want you to type something into a token and get the code out of that, type it back into the website so we know that you are sitting at the computer and actually initiating these actions. Um, requiring multiple steps isn't enough just for them to like click a thing and say, is this what you want? Click. Because that could just be something that you could automate from some JavaScript, um, you know, to, to interact with a number of steps. Um, like in the example video, I talked about the ING direct um, cross-site um, cross request forgery vulnerability, and um, they required multiple steps, but they could just, um, that doesn't stop them from carrying out the attack. Um, if the attacker can guess what those steps are. So challenge and response defenses. So if you, um, it is kind of, it is blind to the attacker though. So if the information is coming back to the user and says like type this in, for example, that can help um, doing um, re-authentication. So get them to type their password again to say, yes, you know, really I am this person. I am not only wanting this um, request, but I can prove that I am me by putting my password in again. It is capture which you know tries to make sure that it's not like an automated offense because you're a human that can like to de can detect uh, some traffic lights or something um you can use one time passwords and authentication tokens like i mentioned like with internet banking um and these things provide a really strong defense but it affects the user experience like there's a usability trade off there um a second confirmation step could confirm the details with a generated token so for example, that's the way that PayPal confirmation happens. So with PayPal, you can have a link that literally says, pay this person 10 pounds or dollars or whatever. You click the link and then it uses um, cross-site request forgery tokens to check that you are actually trying to, um, to initiate that action. So it has like, it adds multiple steps, but there's like, there's a link that would be, if they didn't have extra things, incredibly vulnerable. But then it does the extra steps afterwards to um, check that you are actually initiating that action and you want to, and you can confirm, you see the, the details and then you re-authenticate and all the rest of it, whatever um, they decide that you should do to prove that you are. Um, you can also aim to try and detect these attacks um, because the request will be coming from the victim's IP address. Um, so, so, um, you know, the IP address doesn't help. The attacker's IP address is not involved in the um, the interaction between the victim user and the server because it's coming from the victim user's web browser. That's the whole point. Um, so it's their IP address. Um, so unless your mitigations are designed in advance, it might not be possible to differentiate from legitimate requests from users. So if, you're, if you didn't think about this stuff when you designed the... Um, your security, then your um, the logs might not give you many clues. You can look at things like headers and referrers and things like that, which could help. So referrer that shows that some um, evil website.com uh, was the referrer of this get request that then transferred the money, then that obviously would be helpful. Um, um, but the referrer is not always um, present in the requests and you know there's um basically you need to try and design this stuff to start with to defining the defenses uh building the defenses so in conclusion cross-site scripting um cross-site request forgery sorry can enable attackers to trick um, users and web browsers into misbehaving uh so unless the server does something to check that requests the the requests and also that there are no cross-site request, um, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, then um, you know you could be vulnerable to um, cross-site request forgery. Thankfully, the situation is improving because a lot of frameworks that people use to build websites um, do make it easy to build these defenses into new websites that are being built. 
Um, but it's really important to make sure that you are using them and that if you deviate from the framework and you start building in extra features and not using the framework to generate forms, for example, and submit, putting your own forms in manually to a website, or if you're writing code without frameworks, um, or you're using PHP because it's so easy to get it wrong, um, that you're just being really careful that you are actually considering how you're defending against this kind of attack. And, and, and actually, as a general um, cybersecurity concept, it's really helpful to think about this kind of attack because it's linked up into this concept of confu the confused deputy problem and just an interesting thing to think about how do you know that when someone's initiated an act, initiating an action um, that um, you're receiving a command whether they actually initiated that action or, or is it that they've been tricked into performing the action uh, it's quite all really useful and interesting concepts in um, in security